Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! No! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I'm your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Hello. I have become concerned about my own fitness for Paris. Oh. So, as we have been told, it is a marathon Hint, hint, not a sprint. <laughs> I have been trying to go out and, and do some longer walks in the extreme heat we're having right now in the Northeast. It has been 90 degrees all week. It's super humid. And I have a very lovely training partner, my adorable dog, who unfortunately now is 14 years old and loves a good walk still. She's still very spry, but not when it's 90 degrees out. Oh. So she just looks at me like, Mama, I am not coming to Paris with you. I did not sign up as your training partner. I am not okay with this. Thankfully, I have not put the 25-pound backpack on her. <laughs> but maybe what I should do, because she's about 14 pounds, is I should put her in the backpack and there walk around with her. So that may be the training sessions for the rest of the week. There you go. I have been working on my sleep deprivation training. <laughs> Because we did have the World Press Briefing yesterday, which was an all-day affair starting at 3.30 a.m. local time. It was very, very interesting. We learned a lot. So I'm very grateful to have had that experience virtually because we could not make it live. But there's a lot of planning to do. I will say that. Just slap your dog on your backpack and we'll go <laughs> hiking and planning. Good connection there because today we are excited to be talking with author Stephen Lane, who has written the new book, Long Run to Glory, the story of the greatest marathon in Olympic history and the women who made it happen. This book is about the development of women's marathon as a sport, how it became included in the Olympics and the very first Olympic marathon at LA 1984, which was an epic race. Uh, spoiler alert. Gold went to American Joan Benoit, silver to Norwegian Greta Veit, bronze to Portugal's Rosa Mota, and fourth to another star of the sport, Norwegian Ingrid Christensen. So Stephen is the meet director for the Adrian Martinez Classic, a festival of distance races, and he teaches history and economics at Concord Carlisle High School in Massachusetts. Take a listen to our conversation. Stephen Lane, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed this book. Thank you. It's great to be here. I obviously, like you guys, I'm a massive fan of the Olympics <laughs> and find it, you know, it takes over my world when it's on. So I think it's a really cool podcast you have to try to bring it all together. So I'm thank glad you. to be here. And we do love to get a chance to talk about how so many people thought women's uterus were going to fall out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go back to the beginning as your book does, starting yeah. with Boston Marathon. And what mm -hmm. surprised me was Catherine Switzer was not the first woman hmm. to run the Boston Marathon. Yeah, it's funny. And I don't know the full origin of that mix up. I do know that, <laughs> not to engage in too much drama, but there are factions in the old women's marathon pioneering movement. There's kind of like the Bobby Gibb faction and the Catherine Switzer faction. And, you know, they all get along. I think they all recognize their contributions. But the best I can think is that the photographs of Switzer getting attacked by Jock Semple were so compelling and just told a story that any newspaper article about Bobby Gibb never really could match. And so maybe that in some people's minds just became Switzer must have been first. And Switzer, to her credit, recently has taken pains to correct that. And she is the first woman to run with a number, which she she makes a point of claiming. But yeah, Gibb was first. And they're both such cool stories. And what I like about both stories is that there was this irresistible attraction to the idea of the marathon. And Bobby Gibbs says she saw it with her father the first time and maybe 
1964. And she's like, I have to do this. These are my people. I have to be there. And so in 1966, she did it. And Switzer in her memoir tells a story of running track. And I think it's really funny that she got recruited to be on the men's track team in college because they didn't have enough milers. And she's running the mile and one of her teammates goes up to run Boston Marathon in the spring and comes back and she's like, what? There's a, a marathon? Like she's just grabbed by it at that point. And then when she moves up to Syracuse, she transfers to Syracuse University. She starts doing runs with this guy who had run Boston, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 times. And he is, like many people, just enthralled to the Boston Marathon. It's this mythical, mystic event to him. So Switzer gets caught up in that. And so they end up running it together in 1967. And I just think you're from New England, so maybe you get it. But the Boston Marathon just has this hold on running that is hard to articulate. And I don't know, you, you either get it or you don't, but <laughs> that's all I can say. And it, it definitely grabbed both of them. And I think that to me is a cool place to start the story. It's just that it, once the marathon gets its hooks in you, maybe it's hard to get rid of. It's more than just another race, you know? So the Olympic men's marathon has been there since the beginning, since 1896, yeah. Yeah. but it wasn't a huge event. It was really the seventies that we see. And you talk about in your book, the big running boom in the United States. Uh, the marathon originally was, I don't want to demean it, but it was almost kind of an exhibition or a sideshow in the early Olympics. It was open to a wider field. And, you know, in the early days, nobody really trained for it exactly. Road racing generally in the marathon in particular were events that drew from working class athletes. And for them, the marathon was, I guess, if you're working eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day doing hard manual labor, like how hard can a marathon be? So a lot of the early marathoners are like bricklayers or worked in mines or metal work or things like that, like farm laborers. They were used to hard, hard work. And so the marathon was just a thing they did. And, and so I think a lot because of that class issue, that class distinction, the marathon didn't get the same press or the same esteem perhaps as the track events. Until, as you say, the 70s, and I think the running boom starts a little bit earlier, it gets going in the 60s. And I think for all kinds of reasons, more professional class, upper middle class people are drawn to running. Partly, suddenly they have more leisure time. <laughs> There's a guy in the book, Paul Milvey, who talking about the 1970s said, you know, we jog while Rome burns. And I thought it was this really interesting idea that to a certain group of people in the 1970s, it felt like society was falling apart. Maybe like now, I don't know, but it felt like the United States was falling apart for all kinds of reasons. We were losing or lost the Vietnam War. The Soviets were a huge threat. The economy was terrible. There was still that kind of struggle working its way through the country from the 1960s and the protests. And so in this sort of fractured society where I think you probably felt a tremendous loss of control, a loss of the ability to guide your own destiny, here was running and you could do it. You weren't dependent on anybody else. And there's a scholar, Cooper, who she wrote that running was a denial of helplessness for working class runners in sort of the pre-war and immediate post-war era. And I think the upper middle class American society started to feel that helplessness a little bit in the 70s. And so they running became their thing as well. I think especially for women, right? That idea of a denial of helplessness, this idea that so much of the doors in society seemed closed to women. Here was this thing. They could put on shoes and go run. And it gave them a sense of agency, identity, power that society seemed intent on denying to them in some ways. And, and Nina Cusick, one of the early marathon pioneers, started running after a kind of a brutal divorce. And she said she needed something to know she mattered, that to know that she was important. And she found that in running. That's a really powerful idea, I think, that that drew people to running. Maybe to no one else but yourself, but you could feel like a hero. It filled a need and running took off all over the world, but particularly in the United States, running took off and road races were there because unlike track events, 
there's no limit how many people you can put on a road. So they gravitated toward road races. And then the marathon became, you know, it's got that pull on people. And it really took off. So also limiting in track events, there was no distance events for women at this point. No. And, you know, to go back to your comment about uh, uteruses falling out and the track being littered with uh, (laughs) internal organs. When I wrote the book, I had a really long chapter about some of the fights over medical history. And there were physicians, predominantly female physicians in Germany in the early 1900s who compiled all this evidence that women obviously were very suited for intense athletic competition and endurance competition. And, you know, of course, all their studies were discounted as obviously not objective (laughs) because they were done by women. And so you had all that evidence that women could do this. And I always think if you go back to probably any time in history, like working class women were they were working hard, right? There, there's plenty of evidence that women could do anything that men could do in terms of labor and in terms of really tough effort. I think all of the attempts to deny women entry into the Olympics and then into Olympic track and field and then into the endurance events was sort of all about trying to preserve some kind of citadel of, of manly virtue, I guess, is the way I would think about it, that the Olympics was conceived as this sort of sanctuary for manly traits. And the, the guys who controlled it were very reluctant to admit women into, into this temple. And so they found their reasons. But yeah, you probably know the story very well of the 1928 women's 800 meters. I had heard the story, but then in researching the book, I actually got footage of it. And oh my gosh, what a phenomenal race. There's so many great things going on in that race. And you have these tremendous rivals and and tremendous talents. And the top three women smash the old world record. And in any objective light, this women's 800 meters from 1928 would be considered one of the greatest races in history. Very rarely do you see that kind of effort and those kind of times in a distance track event at the Olympics, because you've got to go through prelims and all, there's all these reasons why, but these women did it. And almost immediately, (laughs) there's like these falsified stories of women collapsing at the line and they can't handle it and all that stuff. And so that was used as pretext to nearly to eliminate women's track and field from the Olympics altogether, but it was limited severely events no more than 200 meters until 1960, which is just mind boggling to me. And then 1960, you get the women's 800, 1972, you get the women's 1500. And then that's the longest event for women until 1984, until the first marathon. You know, it's a funny, like, cause I, I love track and field, but the comment I get most often when I tell people I'm writing this book, they're like, really? First marathon was in 1984? Like, that's crazy. I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. But that's where the Olympics were. Well, also crazy is there were a couple of points in the book where you talked about two different runners who ran races while pregnant. <laughs> and that has suddenly become, not suddenly, but it has seemed like a recent phenomenon to see mm. women running while pregnant and making a big deal out of it. But it really seemed like women are just like, well, I found this thing I'm going to do and I'm going to do it. And then people will accept me eventually. Yeah. So that part you refer, I think, Ingrid Christensen, who ran, she didn't know she was pregnant. She ran the the World Cross Country Championships while pregnant. And <laughs> funny story, I didn't include in the book, but her coach, Johan Kajestad, was mystified by how poorly she ran at World Cross Country Championships. And his wife said, maybe she's pregnant. You got to ask her. He's like, oh no, I'm not. (laughs) I'm not not touching that. But yeah, it turned out she was pregnant. And so true confession, my wife is a, she's a very good distance runner. She's a, she ran at the Olympic trials in the marathon and for her company does, do you guys know the Ragnar relay? Yeah. The one that's like all night long. Yeah, Yeah. 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 It's like, 48 hours or so. And the big one out here is in New Hampshire and it ends up on the beach. And, you know, it's great. It's a great thing. Um, And she's done that with her work colleagues for many years, but she was seven months pregnant with our second child with Emma um, when Ragnar was coming up. And I confess, I could not help but be worried 
that this would be bad for the baby. And I read everything and it's, it's fine. It, there's no real risk of harm to running and exercising while pregnant and all that stuff. And the rational part of me could come to terms with that, but emotionally, I couldn't help but be worried, which I think says something about how deeply those myths have been ingrained in our society. And it's, you know, it's really interesting. And you, gosh, you talk about now, who was it, Alicia Montano, who ran the Olympic trials pregnant. And I didn't think anything of it. And then I didn't realize until reading later, it was, it was sort of a, a protest, but also she's going to get her bonus for appearing in the Olympic trial. She's got to, there's no maternity leave <laughs> in her contract. So running the trials while pregnant was a way to hit her bonuses and get paid, but also to draw attention to this. And gosh, what a powerful statement and image that was too. The whole intersection of making, I guess the way I'd phrase it is men trying to protect women in athletics is it's just, it's fascinating and depressing <laughs> at the same time. Going back to the seventies, I was mm. actually surprised in your book in a way how quickly the women's marathon got into the Olympics once that lobbying really mm began in earnest. <laughs> yeah, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee was obviously generations behind in many ways. And, and the IOC as an organization is I, very conservative. And I, I, I don't necessarily mean that in the political sense, but in the sense of, you know, they believe that they're conserving something which has this, you know, in the modern sense, it's history that go back to 1896, but in the real classical sense, you know, it goes back several thousand years. And so they, they tend to move slowly in terms of changing what the Olympics look like. So that cultural conservancy, I think, is her conservativeness is sort of ingrained in how they move. And yet... They did move really quickly in <laughs> in Olympic timescales, which is you know a little bit faster than glacial timescales in getting the women's marathon in. And the reason I think is they were a little bit afraid of losing control of maybe women's distance running, but maybe this new big and popular event. And there's a history of that in the IOC wants to be the the people who put on the global athletic showcase right they, and but there's no law or anything that says they're the ones that get to put on the global athletic showcase they do it by trying to control athletics and make sure that the pinnacle in every sport is is the olympics and if you go back in history the only way the IOC moved to bring women's track and field into the Olympics at all was because Alice Milliat, a French athletics administrator, started her own women's Olympics and it grew really popular really fast. And so suddenly you had this other global Olympic athletic showcase that was potentially a rival and competitor to the Olympics as we think of them. And so in order to eliminate the threat from the women's Olympics, they brought women's athletics into their Olympics. I, they would not have done so willingly, I don't think, at that time. And so that through line, I think we see again and again in the 1960s and 70s, a number of women's events were added to the track and field schedule, all under the threat of track and field breaking away and having their own world championships. And the Olympics didn't want that to happen. It happened anyway, starting in 1983, you had the first track and field world championships. But in order to stay at sort of the pinnacle of athletics, the Olympics has to sometimes move very quickly. And with the women's marathon, I think they felt a little threatened that this thing had grown so popular so quickly. And you had Catherine Switzer created a, a global series of events. And the pinnacle of that was sponsored by Avon Cosmetics. And the pinnacle, they had a world marathon championship every year. And then you had a, a Japanese cosmetics company, Shiseido, also created what they called the Tokyo International Women's Marathon. And that became almost a de facto world championships. And of course, you had Fred Lebo in New York, New York City Marathon, promoting 
women's marathoning. And you had Nike, which hasn't always been on the right side of history, but at the time they were huge supporters of women's running. And so you had this corporate money backing women's marathoning and implicitly maybe threatening to create a breakaway kind of marathoning world championship that if you're the International Olympic Committee, you see as potentially a rival. And so under threat, the IOC can move quickly. And they did. They did in the case of the Women's Olympic Marathon. If you think about maybe, gosh, I don't know, the early 1970s is when there first started to be some, a little drumbeat like, hey, why don't women have a marathon? It seemed absurd to a lot of people at that time. They're like, why should there be? The longest race is the 1500, the mile. And so at the time it seemed crazy, but that drumbeat picked up steam quickly. And then by 1978, 79, it's like, no, really, why shouldn't the women have an Olympic marathon? And for the IOC to jump on board in February, 1981, yeah, that was fast. But I think they felt a little threatened by the growth of women's marathon. I want to make sure we get to the women, yeah. like Joni Benoit, yeah. Greta Weitz. And so let's start with Joni Benoit, who oh I remember her. Yeah. She's amazing. So let's talk about her. Oh, man. Well, I, I know you mentioned that 1984 was what first sparked your love of the Olympics. And, and 1984 for me was I, my first introduction to, I think, elite level running. And I was born in 1971. So I guess I was 13. And I just remember coming down on it. You know, it's a Sunday. And in my family, you know, if the Olympics were happening, the TV was on probably watching the Olympics. And I just come down and, and the women's marathon is on. And the image I can't get out of my head is one of Joan Benoit all alone on the Marina Freeway. At that point, she's something like two minutes ahead of her nearest competitor. And it's just this stunning image of her coming over the rise of this freeway all alone. And, and that's always stuck with me. And I think that is sort of the, maybe the origin of me wanting to write this book. And you know what? Ask anybody about Joni and anyone in the running world. And the thing that, that people have a hard time articulating is how tough she is. And <laughs> the word like, <laughs> She's an animal. She's a monster. She's like, all you know, I think the director of the Chicago Marathon said, peel back that skin and there's an alien underneath. You know, all these things like to get across this idea of inhuman toughness, which is all very true. But what I wanted to try to dive in with her was there's also a lot of doubt, which I think for any probably elite athlete there is. Anytime you say, I want to be the best in the world, there's not much margin for error, right? There, <laughs> there are are, there's probably an infinite number of reasons to think you can't be the best in the world, right? And there, you don't get many data points that say, yes, you can be the best in the world. But And so sticking to that kind of goal to find out just how good you can be and say, I believe I can be the best is, it takes probably unimaginable mental strength. And for a time period, so she set the American marathon record in 1979 at Boston, and after that, for a couple of years, she was up and down a lot. And I think she felt some of the stress about like, can I really make it as a runner? Like, I, this is what I want to do, but I'm not sure I, my running career might be winding up before it even gets started. And so I think dealing with that sense of doubt or wondering is maybe the true measure of her strength and toughness that, you know, in the face of a lot of, you know, a lot of <laughs> obstacles and a lot of difficult results and a lot of setbacks, she stuck with it and she persevered. And that part of her is just so impressive. And she won't talk about it. She doesn't want to, well, I don't know whether she is, how introspective she is, but she doesn't want to talk about it. She doesn't want to let people into that, which you have to respect. But that part of it is it's so impressive. She is justifiably known as one of the toughest competitors ever to, to race. But I think the real measure of her toughness is maybe dealing with the setbacks and doubts that came early in her career that maybe a lot of people might have packed it in, might have moved on, but she wasn't ready to give in. And that's really, to me, that is, that's the true measure of who she is as an athlete. <laughs> and she's like, you know, the, the other side of her, she's just delightful as a, she's so gracious and nice. Like she's been, what is she now? 60 something. She's been telling the story of that 
year of that marathon for like almost 40 years. And I'm sure she's sick of it, <laughs> but she was nice enough to spend time with me and, and talk me through a lot of her career. And she's like unfailingly polite and good with people and such a cheerleader for the new era of runners, right? She didn't, she doesn't really want to live in her past. She wants to celebrate what the women are doing now. And I think that's wonderful. That's really cool. So. A big part of your book is her rivalry. Uh, with Greta Weitz. Yeah. And we don't think of Norway as a hotbed of marathon runners anymore. And yet you had two of the greatest uh, women amazing. runners coming out of there. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And I, I poked around a little bit asking like, why do you think, what was it just luck that you had Greta Weitz and then Ingrid Christensen as two of the greatest ever coming out of Norway at that time? And I, I, I couldn't find a really satisfactory answer. I think the Norwegians certainly culturally maybe are a little more equitable or progressive in terms of what they see women as capable and able to do. Although, you know, Greta Weitz, when she decided she wanted to run, she went to the sporting club in her neighborhood to join. And they said, well, we don't accept women. So, <laughs> so she ended up having to go across town to another club. So they're not, you know, they certainly weren't perfectly equitable, but I think more so than the United States and many other countries. And gosh, I don't know if skiing is such a part of Norwegian athletic culture, especially. And so maybe you had all these people with pretty impressive endurance bases anyway. And I think... Also, Jack Veitz, Greta's husband, alluded to this, and I've seen it mentioned elsewhere that Norway in sports wants to be the best. Even though they're a small country, they want champions. And he said it's kind of ingrained in Norwegian culture that, that you don't win silver, you lose gold. And so, you know, all these things. And, and I think that culture was really difficult for Greta, but I don't know, maybe somehow all that adds up and then maybe it's just luck of the genetic lottery. <laughs> you had Greta Weitz and Ingrid Christensen at the same time. Like Greta Weitz is such a oh figure gosh. in, in yeah. you've got Joan, Joan Benoit and Greta Weitz and Ingrid Christensen all running at the same time. I mean, what a goal mine to have the first Olympic marathon with these legends. Yeah, no, I know. And, and it's funny that Rosa Moda, who won bronze, she was voted, I think this was 2010 or 2011, she was voted the greatest women's marathoner of all time. And I think obviously that would change now, but because, you know, Rosa was not as fast as the others, but gosh, she was so smart and so tough in terms of how she approached championship races that she was able to take down, frankly, faster rivals quite often. But yeah, Joni was almost like a force of nature when she ran and Greta was a little bit more reserved and a little more maybe aloof and cold and calculating in how she approached races. And so they have very contrasting styles as runners. But in many ways, I think, and I think they found this later in life, that they were very similar. They're both very introverted. And I think Greta struggled also with doubts and anxiety about, weirdly though, with Greta, it's not like she didn't exactly have the ups and downs of Joni. For the most part, she was, Greta was, seemed unbeatable, like just this almost cyborg of a runner who, you know, when she showed up for a marathon, everyone else was like, well, we're running for second today. And that's the way it was through the late seventies and early eighties. Like every time she went out to race, she was expected to break a record. And so I think for her, there are doubts and anxieties, but not about can I be the best marathoner? Because she was the best marathoner. It was, is marathoning enough? Are marathoners good enough? Is this event something that is truly testing my capabilities? And am I testing myself against the best runners in the world? And I think until Joan Benoit developed as a rival and then Ingrid, I think for her, the answer was maybe, maybe I should go back to the track because that's where the truly great women are. And I think until maybe 1982, 83, so for a number of years, I think Greta wondered whether she was taking the easy way out by marathoning. That seems hard. Maybe that's hard to say, but marathoning being the easy way out in any sense. But I think she really 
she wanted to test herself against the best. She wanted to prove that she was among the best. And she felt that maybe the best, most accomplished athletes were still on the track. And so she had the same kind of questions about her career as a marathoner for a while. She had to overcome a lot of sort of anxiety and doubt in that way. And I think one of my goals in writing this book, I no longer coach, but I used to coach track and field and cross country and at the high school level and the college level, but mostly high school. High schoolers, I, it might be more than high schoolers, but high schoolers for sure look at really good runners. Like if you're like one of the top runners in the state, they look at me like, hey, they're like unbeatable. They're indomitable. They have everything together. They, they've just got it. Why can't I be more like that? And I found myself telling even very accomplished athletes, look, everybody has doubts. Everybody has fears. You just, you know your own because you're in your own head. You don't see everybody else's all the time because they're trying to keep that inside. And so one of my goals in writing this was to try to get at the way that Greta and Joni and Ingrid and the others tried to deal with their own doubts and fears about being an elite marathoner, just to kind of show that, you know, every, every runner has to face this. I suspect every athlete does. Maybe just the marathon gives you more time to get stuck in your own head. And I, you know, I was really struck by how Ingrid and Greta and Joni, all of whom we look at today as legends, they had to fight through some of their own mental blocks or concerns or worries to get there. And all three of them also admit to getting incredibly nervous to the point of almost not being able to function in society <laughs> leading up to a marathon. Maybe nervous is the wrong word, but you're so energized and so focused. And yeah, I, I do think a little anxious about what lies ahead, but they've really, maybe the week leading up to a big marathon was a real, real struggle for them. I think that's important for runners to know that even the best in the world have to get through this, have to fight through what's in their own head and, and come to terms with that, that nervous energy and still be productive. So I think that I wanted to try to show that side of those runners because it's an important part of their success. They weren't just physically talented. They were mentally incredibly strong in, in dealing with their own fears. So I love that you gave me the segue. One of the big fears for LA was the heat. Mm, there was a yeah. lot of talk leading up to that. And it's so funny because of what happened in Tokyo and, and what people mm -hmm. are worried about in Paris was, yeah. is it going to be too hot to safely yeah. run the marathon? Though these women were really preparing for that. Yeah. The, gosh, the whole heat thing. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to this, but the women's Olympic trials, this will be the 40th anniversary of the first Olympic trials and the women's Olympic trials for the marathon will be in Orlando as will the men, right? I think they're both in together. And the start time is going to be like noon. And a lot of people were sort of upset by this, like you're starting something in the heat of the day in Orlando. And, and I think there's some of that fear of the heat, you know, we're going to see again in that buildup. Now it turns out Orlando in the beginning of February might not be that hot, probably won't be that hot, but that fear of the heat and what it will do to runners is, yeah, it's coming back. And part of me wonders if a little bit it is again, you know, we got to protect women. I think that's less of an issue here, but I do, I always do wonder about that a little bit, but I think a bigger part, you know, I can only speak to distance runners, but they tend to be control freaks. Like they like to control as much as they possibly can. And the weather obviously is something you can't. <laughs> and so I think one of the maybe real strengths of Joan Benoit that maybe the others, or at least Ingrid and Greta, struggled with a little more was adaptability. Joni, like anytime you, you see an interview with Joni about, you know, what's your race plan? She like, she cuts it off me and she says, I don't have a race plan. I go and race how I feel. And that's true to a point. I think she always has a has an idea in her head of how she wants the race to unfold and, and a plan for what she wants to do. At least it's not, you know, super regimented, but I think she has her ideas of what she wants to do. But, but I think part of the reason she says that is that she wants to be adaptable. She wants to show up on race day, figure out the conditions and figure out what we're going to do, figure out how she's feeling, get a sense of the other women and, and go from there. So in that way, she might have been better suited to what happened, which 
in LA, it turned out to not be that hot. <laughs> it just turned out there, you know, there's a marine layer in the morning, there's a little bit of fog, which took a while to burn off. And it just never really got that hot. And I think Greta especially had planned on the heat sapping Joni a little bit. And so I think Greta held back a little bit more than that's tough. Like <laughs> hindsight's 2020. But I, I do wonder if had Greta been more prepared to just say to herself, I'm gonna show up, see what the conditions are like, and race based on that, if maybe she would have been more aggressive in going after Joni earlier. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Ingrid has said that, yeah, her coaches and trainers got too much in her head with the heat and that, and that they, you know, Sabrina, the heat, the heat, the heat's going to come get everybody. And, and so she says that that changed her mentality in the race and, and she didn't respond as she wished she had. And she doesn't blame anybody for that other than herself, but she acknowledges this is what happened. You know, we prepared for heat period, and then it wasn't hot and she found herself unable to adapt as I now obviously she wish she did. So yeah, that was, that was funny because I remember, I don't know if you remember, like the whole build up to LA was, oh my God, heat, smog, it's going to be a disaster. And, and to an extent they got lucky. The weather was mild and the winds were such that the smog blew out. And for the women especially, it was really nice. But I think for most of the two weeks of the Olympics, they could not have asked for better conditions. And also Rosa Mota was used to running in heat and humidity yeah. and that she ended up doing okay. Yeah. I think, God, she's so interesting because I think, yes, she felt she was a good heat runner. To go back to the Olympic trials that are upcoming... There's a lot of sort of complaints about, oh, a noon start. And I read comments by Des Linden and she said two things. Like one, I usually start my runs around 11. So this is great. This gives me another hour to sleep in and do all that. And the other thing she said is, you know what? I run well in the heat. So I'm psyched for this. I hope it's hot. I hope it takes some of the spring out of the young kid's legs. And I, I think the one thing that Des is doing other than just stating how she feels is trying to make the point that you have the conditions and you it's a it's incumbent on you to figure out how that can work to your advantage and be positive about it not fearful of it but find a way to be positive about what's going on and say how can i use this to help me beat my rivals and i think rosa was really good at that and so i think yeah, she was pretty good in heat, but she's also like, I know I'm not the fastest woman in the field, right? If it's an all out, let's go break world records today kind of race, she knows she's getting left behind. And so I think Rosa, maybe more than most of the others, probably went in with a kind of a positive attitude. Like, I hope it's hot, man. <laughs> I hope this is tough. And I think that's a really, you know, as I say, a really important thing that you can learn is how can you take the conditions and, as I say, try to turn it into a positive for you? Ask yourself, how can I use this or adapt to this the best way possible? And Rosa, I think she's such a smart runner, so thoughtful. I think she and Des have a lot in common in terms of how they run. Neither one of them is the fastest, but boy, they're smart and competitive and find a way. You do a great job in the book of going minute by minute through <laughs> the race. And I remember watching this as a kid being mm -hmm. so excited that women were getting the marathon. Yeah. But what I do remember is the announcers were not good because <laughs> the two things that they talked about that still stick with me all mm -hmm. these years later is one, they made a huge deal about Joan Benoit skipping the first water station. Yeah. Like that was going to be the deciding factor in the yeah. entire race. And the other thing that they kept talking about was how strange it was for her to be running alone and not surrounded by men because in most marathons were mixed. Yeah. Yeah. But the book tells me that neither one of those things was really true. Yeah. I talked to Catherine Switzer a lot, obviously, and she was doing commentary. And I talked to Marty LaCorey as well, who was also doing commentary. And number one, I will say I have a lot of sympathy for television announcers because especially for the marathon because you know you, <laughs> 26 miles is a long time and you know you can only say so many times yep they're still running yep there they go and i think for the first part of the race they were getting bad information 
At one point they say, I think it's a mile one or two, like, oh, they're on world record pace. And, and if you're watching them run, you know, they're not on world record pace, you know, they're jogging, right? You can just see it. And so I know whatever the producer is saying in their ear, they're getting bad info, but also that surprised me that they couldn't look at the runners and see like, okay, we're something's off here. We're not getting good information about that. I mean, between them, let's see, they had Bill Rogers, who was on the press truck, and then Marty LaCorey and Catherine Sutter. You had some really experienced runners there. And I suppose they probably regret that part of the call. But yeah, I think, yeah, skipping the water station, they made a lot of that. And then I think that maybe they, all the broadcasters are maybe talking from their own experience and what they liked. I don't know. Does that make sense? It's like, some people like running in a crowd, but I know from my own coaching experience, right? You can set up a plan like, okay, this is what we'd like to do. We'd like you to stick with leaders, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, there's some kids that they just, they can't, they feel like bunched in and they get tighter and more nervous because they're running around people and they, they just got to be, they just got to get out and run free and they'll do better. Maybe they'll get chased down in the end, but it's still how they like to run. And, and that was Joni. Joni didn't like running with other people. <laughs> You know, she admits it too in, in terms of how she trained, but Tony Rebus, who has done running broadcasts forever, I guess, he once said, even in training, Joan Benoit ran at a pace that didn't include others. And that's how she liked to train. And if you were training with her, she might try to just pop ahead a step. And so she tended to keep ratcheting down the pace when she was with others without even thinking about it. And so I think... Yes, the idea that, oh, it's so hard to lead a race, it takes so much mental energy. Well, to an extent, that's true, but Joni felt better that way. And I know for sure in the case of Ingrid, because she told me she's very upfront about it, but I also think many of the others, probably not Greta, because Greta's like, I got my plan, I'm doing it, I think it's going to work. But I think the others, there's a little bit of nervousness of like, are we okay with the world record holder? being a minute in front of us? Is this our right? Like, I think Joni, I don't think this was her intent, but she bred a lot of nervous energy into the pack. Like Joni was just doing like, this is how I feel. I want to run faster than we're going. I mean, they weren't going very fast. So she just started getting a little bit in front. It wasn't a decisive move early on, but I think the others suddenly are like, what are we doing here? Like, why are we letting her go? But gosh, the dynamics of the pack are so cool and interesting. But then they're like, but that's Greta Weitz right there. And she's the best marathoner ever. And if she's not going, I'm not going to go. It, you can almost see the wheels turning in a bunch of people's heads. And they kind of glance over at Greta, like, what's she doing? So yeah, I think there was more mental energy wasted in the pack about Joni being in front than Joni wasted being in front. I think that's just an interesting part of the race and maybe hard to articulate if you're doing commentary <laughs> on ABC. I don't know. I have never been in a broadcast booth and I just would be terrified to try to do. But you're right. The broadcasters early on in the race had some issues in terms of how they talked about it. One of the other things I didn't realize was the fact that Joan Benoit's coming off of knee surgery and Greta Weitz had just back seized stuff right before the race. So your top contenders aren't really in their prime that we know of going in. Oh, it's ridiculous. If you wrote a movie script, like a sports movie script, people are like, come on. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. So Joan Benoit tweaks her knee in March. I think it's like 50 something days before the Olympic trials. And, you know, obviously if you don't, finish top three at the Olympic trials, you're not going to the Olympics. And when she tweaks her knee, she sees her doctor and they're trying to plan an approach. And I think the sensible thing to do is to be conservative because they're thinking, well, gosh, it's 50 days to the Olympic trials. If we have surgery now, can you even get back in time? You know, get all the rehab and all that stuff. And so they, they hold off on surgery. And one of the interesting things, I think Joni in her memoir talks about how she knew this injury wasn't just a little thing that would go away, you know, take a week off, have a cortisone shot, you'd be back on. She's like, I knew this was different. I knew something was wrong. But she didn't feel like she could articulate that to her doctor. She's like, this guy is a surgeon. He's operated on me before. This is his realm. And what he's saying makes sense. And then she's like, but I know me and I know this isn't the right 
approach, but she didn't feel like she could articulate that or challenge him in his field, which I think is really an interesting thing. But anyway, yeah, so the injury lingers and lingers and she can't quite shake it and she'll get back into hard training and feel great. And then one day the knee will lock up again and she can't, and she can't really run. And so it's not until 17 days before the Olympic trials that, that she has surgery, which is, it's like mind blowing. Like at that point, like the Olympics should be off. I've had my knees scoped twice, much later than Joni. And I know the technology got, has gotten better as we go. But gosh, 17 days after surgery, maybe I can jog a mile or two, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, what I remember is like my knee, like the range of motion was in there. I couldn't really bend it as much as you need to. Like, there's just no way. And it hurts, obviously. You've got four incisions into your knee. And just the thought of, you know, that pounding on that knee and those incisions for 26 miles, it's impossible. But she's Joni. <laughs> and people already knew she was tough. But to win the Olympic trials marathon 17 days after knee surgery is just, it's unbelievable. It's superhuman. And so that story, gosh, I think that two, three week period would be a great movie in its own right. Just Joni getting through the Olympic trials. Gosh, what a story. And then, yeah, Greta wakes up the day before the race and she can't walk. Like she just, like her back somehow seized up. I talked to Jack about this a lot and he's like, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I, they did switch rooms at one point. He's like, maybe the bed in this new room was softer. He's like, but no, it just didn't make any sense. But her back seized up. She couldn't move again. It's like, come on for Greta. Gosh, her first Olympics was 1972 in the 1500. And she came back in 1976, but had always felt like she hadn't had a chance to test herself against the best on a level playing field, feeling her best. And here came this other Olympic chance, gosh, 12 years after her first Olympics. And she felt this was what she'd always been waiting for. This is what her career had been about. And suddenly it's like, it's not going to happen. And so they spend the day trying to do rehab and taking muscle relaxants and nothing seems to improve it. Okay. She can finally start to walk, but very stiffly. And, you know, I, it, the two, I think most amazing things about this story is one, she and her team go to the, the warm up track because they're going to try, well, maybe we can just loosen up, but she literally can barely walk, but she realizes, okay, I'm around other people. Nobody can know that I'm hurt. Right. <laughs> Nobody can know I'm vulnerable. So somehow she like, toughens up enough to be able to, like, I can jog a mile or two and, and not look like I'm hurting. And somehow she does that, even though she's in immense pain the entire time. But it, it does not seem like there's any way she's going to be able to run a marathon and certainly not run at full speed. So they're working and working. And, and finally, one of her trainers makes this weird suggestion. And her husband, Jack, he tried to articulate the meaning of her suggestion, but he said, the trainer was versed in what he called viscini ways or what he, he says like wise women ways. And the nearest translation I could get was maybe like folk medicine. And this trainer said, well, put some heavy stuff in a backpack, put the backpack on, walk around. <laughs> and she did. And it worked. Like, so I have no idea what, maybe it was, I don't know if this will work, but we're, we just got to try something. But it, work suddenly like the spasm stopped and the tension eased and and she started to feel a little more normal but that's the day before the race it's just mind-blowing you know she's so that night she goes to bed 12 hours before on the biggest race of her life and i think she's still not convinced she's going to be able to compete but she wakes up and she doesn't hurt she's still really tight and i cannot imagine the emotional strain of that kind of up and down, like, okay, I'm preparing for the Olympics. Nope. Now I can't run at all. And, and spending the day in that kind of emotional kind of purgatory, I cannot imagine, but she wakes up and she's like, well, doesn't matter. It's the Olympics. No matter how I feel, I got to be on the line. And, and she never used that as an excuse. Jack's never used it as an excuse. She said, Joni was better. And I think they both really believe that. But you maybe wonder, what if? What if that hadn't happened? Watching the marathon and watching the warm-ups before the marathon, Greta looks 
tight, and she looks more anxious than usual, I will say. So I think it had to be on her mind, but gosh, she toughed out that race really well. And we ended up with this beautiful cinematic finish oh my gosh. of the runners coming through the tunnel <laughs> and around the track oh at the Coliseum. Yeah. You couldn't get a more beautiful finish to this race. Right. I know. it. Yeah. I, I can only imagine what it must have been like to be in the stadium. And yeah, to see the runners come out of the tunnel. I think it's a little over 100 meters long, the tunnel, and it curves under the stadium because the Coliseum is actually sits underground. So ground level would be about even with level two in the Coliseum. So the tunnel goes down and it curves around and you pop out near the 100 meter starting line. And so, you know, out of the darkness into the light. And I remember talking to Catherine Switzer, who's doing the announcing. And she said at that point, watching Benoit come out of the tunnel. It was so hard to focus on the job, right? It's so hard. Like, okay, I'm a professional. I'm an announcer. I'm supposed to be a little bit objective, but Switzer had worked much of her adult life to get the Olympic marathon, make it a reality. And here she is witnessing it and, and what that must have felt like for her. I can only imagine. And you have a, a packed Coliseum on their feet cheering for women's marathoners. It must have been emotionally overwhelming for Switzer, and she's trying to keep her mind on the job at hand, which is calling the race. It's truly an incredible moment. And, and for Benoit, she was so locked in, so focused. And I think she was very, very good at tuning everything else out. She probably didn't really let herself go until she's maybe like halfway around the track. And she's like, oh my God. And then she starts waving all the stuff. And it, it is, as you say, a cinematic moment. It's truly, truly an incredible triumph for Joni, of course, but for women's running. And Greta, I think also to go from, I can't run at all to, I can run, but I don't know if I'll be able to finish. I don't know if the back will seize up to a silver medal. I think in ways that we don't usually see from Greta in races, she appeared overwhelmed by the event and the feeling of joy at being a part of it and coming through with a silver medal. I think it was a tremendous moment for her. And then <laughs> Rosa Moda coming in third. I mean, she looks like she won. It, it's incredible. And I think that's when you start to get the sense of what this meant and I wasn't even good enough to like dream about being an Olympian, but the idea of what the Olympics mean probably to every athlete in the Olympics, but then especially for a historic first race and for what that meant for women's running and for somebody like Rosa, who <laughs> she's running through the streets of her hometown in Portugal, guys are yelling, you know, go home and help your mama with the dishes and stuff like that. And to come from that to if the marathon had never been an Olympic event, Moda would have been, she was still the best distance runner in Portugal, but she would have been like one of the last finishers in the 1500 or the 3000 of the Olympics to being, because this event was finally open to women, to being a medalist. She truly looks like maybe all of that came out in her mind on that last lap. She's in tears, both hands are over her head. She just can't believe this is how it's gone. It's her finish is honestly one of my favorite moments of the whole race. It's just so powerful. It really is. The last thing I want to ask is, can we overstate how much impact this had on women's athletics and women's sports in general? Wow. It's probably always easy to overstate it. <laughs> I think a couple things that, that I would say to that and this is about the Olympic marathon, but also the whole road to getting the Olympic marathon is that I think Joni and Greta, especially the way they ran and the way they conducted themselves. And also I think partly because most road races, the field is mixed, right? Everybody's in there together. It was hard to say, well, they run well for a girl or they're, you know, they're good athletes for a girl, not only because they were beating like 99% of the guys in like the Boston Marathon or the New York Marathon, but just the way they ran and they were so, just so tough and so good that I think, I think they changed the way people think about women's running and women's runners and maybe by extension then all of women's athletics. Ingrid Christensen at one point says that 
Greta taught them all what was possible if they trained like men. And I think that's a really interesting quote, but I think societal biases ingrained, like, oh, you know, to go back to the original thing we were talking about, like we have to protect women in athletics. And you watch Joni and Greta run, like they don't need protection. Like if anything, we need protection from them. They are so tough. And so I think that they changed perceptions in ways that maybe aren't explicit, but became maybe a little bit ingrained in how people think about running. And so I think that's really important. And the other thing, and this is me as a high school teacher talking, is that it is vital that people see people who look like them doing great things. And yes, Joni and Greta, they won Boston, they won New York, all these things, but the Olympics is the pinnacle, right? It is the ultimate in athletics. And for hundreds of millions of people to watch these women contest the marathon, I think mattered. And again, I don't know that you could draw the explicit steps, like here's how many people entered marathons the next year or anything like that. But I just think it is so important for young people to see people who look like them doing great things. And for girls all over the world, maybe seeing this Olympic marathon and seeing how they contested it and how they comported themselves in a way that maybe had never existed before, they could say, yes, that's what I want to be. I don't think you can overstate that part of it. And, And so I think... If nothing else, that that impact of the marathon will, has lasted and lasted. Wonderful. Stephen Lane, thank you so much for joining us. And yes. we want everyone to read this book because we really loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. You can find his book through our bookshop dot org storefront that's bookshop.org slash shop slash flame alive pod we will have a link to that in the show notes you can find it on our list featured olympics and paralympics authors on the show all purchases made through the shop bookshop.org link give us a commission which goes to cover the costs of the show and we have a lot of them coming up as we prepare to go to paris i will say if you loved david davis's book and we're a big david davis fan This is on par with that. This was such a good read. So well written. And for us, it was fun because we remember this. But I think for people who don't remember this race, it gives you a really good sense of how, you know, I was a 12-year-old girl watching this and just how incredibly excited I was to have a women's marathon in the Olympics. And it was a big deal. And this really captures that so brilliantly. Thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us and hope the book does well. Now is the time where we have our history moment. All year long, we are looking at the Seoul 1988 games as it is the 30th anniversary of those games. Allison, it is your turn for the story. What do you've got for us? I got women's marathon. Whoop, whoop. This was, as we've said, only the second women's marathon, and it was also quite an epic race. So after the 1984 Olympics, Joan Benoit became Joan Benoit Samuelson and quickly had two children. So she decided to skip the Olympic marathon, though she did finish third in the New York City Marathon that year. So nothing nothing stops Joan Benoit. Ingrid Christensen also chose not to compete in the marathon, but rather in the 10,000 meters instead. She did not finish this race, dropping out after seven laps with a broken foot. What? Greta Weitz did compete in the marathon, but she was struggling with a knee injury and dropped out at around the 18-mile mark. So the day of the race was warm and humid, but the course was mostly flat with a downhill stretch at the end. Huh. So the two top contenders were 1984 bronze medalist Rosa Moda and Australian Lisa Martin, who had the best time in the 1988 marathon season. Now, unlike in Los Angeles, the top runners stayed together for two-thirds of the race, so you didn't have that early breakaway. And Rosa Moda made her move with only two and a half miles to go, pulling away from Martin and East Germans' Katrin Dore. And Moda had a characteristically smart tactical run, as we talked with Stephen about. She was a really smart runner, but she needed an unexpected sprint speed towards the end of this race. She sprinted the last stretch of this race because Moto did win the gold, but she was only ahead of Martin by 60 meters and about 13 Whoa. seconds, which in a marathon, That's they nothing. were in the stadium together running the track. 
and Dora earned bronze less than a half a minute behind Martin. So this was about a minute slower than the 84 time, but considerably more competitive in the sense of all these women could have won up until the last little stretch of the race. Wow. Don't forget that this week is the last week to vote for our historic Olympics and Paralympics for next year. You are choosing what we will discuss. It's another winter games because we flip flop every year. Uh, Our choices are Chamonix 1924, which will be celebrating its 100th anniversary. Sarajevo 1984, which will be celebrating its 40th anniversary. And Lillehammer 1994, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Go to our Facebook group, Keep the Flame Alive podcast group, to cast your vote. We're still looking at a potential Chamonix upset. Chamonix is still in the lead, but it is very, very close between Chamonix and Sarajevo, which surprises me. It seems like people want us to really go back in history. Though, with Chamonix, it's a five-hour train ride from Paris. And as Sean Callahan told us last week, sounds like a lovely, lovely place. So if you want to send us on a train ride through France, (laughs) go vote on our Facebook group for Chamonix. Not that I'm lobbying in any way. (laughs) Welcome to Shiplistan. Now is the time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show and listeners who make up our citizenship of Shuklastan, our very own country. Starting off, Tim Sherry earned bronze medals in men's 300-meter rifle prone and open 300-meter standard rifle at the ISSF World Championships. He will compete. He will be competing at the USA Shooting Rifle Olympic Trials Part One. September 28th through October 3rd in Fort Moore, Georgia. I don't know why there needs to be a sequel. Because obviously this is a part one and a part two, but good luck to Tim. There is. And I think it was one of those, like, we don't want everything to be based on one day. And if you had a bad day, so they balance it out. But I, I, this is all coming back to me after talking with Jenny Thrasher and Tim before, um, before Tokyo that that they do spread this one out but it's almost crazy to think it's time for trials already now and but I know people, people are qualifying we're seeing this all over the place the basketball teams and and individuals and in surfing so yeah it's happening Nordic combined competitor Annika Malasinski competed on the summer Grand Prix circuit in Oberwiesenthal Germany she placed 13th in the individual competition and 10th in the mixed relay. In Obertsdorf, she got 16th in the women's individual. And in Villach, Austria, she took 13th. So next up will be the start of the winter season at the end of November. And it's going to be winter sports season before we know it, too. Allison Levine is competing for gold today while we are taping at the Baccia World Cup event in, in Brazil. Despite kind of a scary accident earlier in the week, she took a fall that ended up uh, sending her to the hospital, but she is fine. I think it could be a broken foot, broken ankle situation, but she's booted up and competing with it. Well, Good luck, Allison, and we hope that your ankle heals quickly. Beach volleyball player Kelly Chang played in the AVP Pro Tour in Chicago last weekend and made it to the semifinal round before being defeated in preview. Her former partner, Betsy Flint, who will soon become a member of Team Keep the Flame Alive, she also competed in Chicago and also made it to the semifinals opposite Kelly in the bracket, which was interesting. I will say I was in Chicago while the tour was going on, and... I was doing an event called Bike the Drive where they shut down Lakeshore Drive and you can ride your bike on it. And I'm also training for a century ride, so I had to do 50 miles. I did my full 50 miles on the drive, but you got kicked off so that they could reopen the road again. So I got booted onto the lakefront path and was riding my bike past the beach volleyball venue. And I thought I saw Kelly warming up. And I know I I felt Patrick from Chicagoland's disappointment. And I thought about dragging my bike over there and I realized I have ridden 52 miles at this point. I have to ride about four more to get to where I need to go. And if I get off this bike, I will never get back on. (laughs) So I thought of Kelly from 
a few hundred meters away. <laughs> Which was probably safer for Kelly. <laughs> probably. I mean, it probably. So... Wheelchair fencer Alan Geddes will be representing the U.S. at the 2023 IAS Wheelchair Fencing World Championships. That's October 3rd through the 8th in Terni, Italy. And Waterman, the movie based on David Davis's book about Duke Kahanamoku, was nominated for a News and Documentary Emmy for Outstanding Historical Documentary. The winners will be announced on September 28th. Also in Shuklistan... We will be at the Olympin 2023 Memorabilia Show, October 13th through 15th at the Hotel MDR in Marina del Rey, California. So if you are in the area, please stop on by. We would love to meet you. And you might be able to get your hands on our 2024 pin, which came in. I saw the picture. I'm so it's excited. So excited. The box was so heavy. <laughs> the box is really heavy. And if you're really lucky, I will show you the pencil drawing that I sent to our designer <laughs> and how he came up with this beautiful design based on my scratching. I don't know, but it was exactly what I was thinking. So stop on by again. That's October 13th through 15th at the Hotel MDR in Marina del Rey, California. Bonjour et olé. Well, when we get to the second piece of news, that'll make more sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So a little bit of news from Paris 2024 this week. Omega has put up a Paralympics countdown clock at Port de la Bordonnée near the Eiffel Tower. So now there are two places, de Lille, where you can go and watch the countdown. Very exciting. This is exciting. Big announcement from Australia and Olympic Committee. <laughs> that the food brand Old El Paso has partnered with them to be the AOC's official meal kit partner. What does that even mean? So Old El Paso, they make all sorts of Mexican food staples. And in Australia, they put together meal kits. So you can buy a box and it'll have all the stuff you need. And I, I would imagine you add the meat yourself. But we're working on finding out what the sponsorship is going to mean for you. But Old El Paso representatives had told us that this is Old El Paso's single biggest foray in sport to date. So this could be fun. I'm hopeful. Favorite Old El Paso products in Australia include Taco Spice Mix, the Hard and Soft Taco Kit, and the Stand and Stuff Hard Taco Kit slash Soft Taco Kit. Um, Stand and Stuff should be one of my B-girl names. Well, <laughs> will you Stand and Stuff Hard, though? <laughs> No, I'm definitely stand and stuff soft. <laughs> oh, now I get it. Sorry. Stand and stuff hard taco kit. Stand and stuff soft taco kit. I had a Diet Coke today. I tell you. I am hopeful that this will include at the very least packaging that is Olympic in nature. But if you are a fan who likes themed food for your opening ceremonies party and you like to support the sponsors that support your teams. Olay. That's right. Could be a good way to provide a, I would say, easy meal for your opening ceremonies party. So we will keep abreast of this situation. If you hear of any other sponsors doing stuff, let us know because we love to hear what's going on with sponsors and like what products you can buy. We have to get on our beat and look because some places have sponsored Team GB already. I'm looking our... for pictures. So if listeners see, go in grocery shopping and you see anything, please Tag us in pictures on social media at Flame Alive Pod. Yes, definitely. The Summer Olympics and Paralympics are less than a year away, and we are hard at work getting you ready to bring you the best stories you can't get anywhere else. Who else and talks about hard and soft taco kits? Right, right. It's the important things. And, and at the World Press Brief, like very important topics to you started coming up in my head. So we need to start making a list of things that we absolutely have to find out and bring you the Olympics that you want to know about. Later in the fall, we'll, we will be launching a Kickstarter program to raise money specifically to help us get to Paris 2024. Be on the lookout for that. We are working on some great supporter. We are working on some great supporter incentives for that endeavor. And in the meantime, you can become a Patreon patron and get bonus episodes about Paris 2024. Give back to your favorite Olympic and Paralympic podcast at flamelivepod.com dot com slash support. 
We've got a little bit of news from the International Paralympic Committee. The IPC has published its 2022 annual report, which came in right before we went to air. So we have to dig into a little bit to see what they talk about. But this is one thing I noticed really quickly. And I realized that the Paralympics are probably the third biggest sporting event in the world. So you think it's a giant organization with a ton of money, right? But its revenues in 2022 were 24.2 million euros, which is $25.9 million. And their expenses used pretty much all of it. In comparison, the IOC's revenues in 2022 were $2.4 billion. So tiny org trying to do a lot of stuff. And doing a lot of stuff. When you look at that number and you think about what they do, it's kind of amazing. And that's going to do it for this week. And let us know your memories from the LA 1984 marathon. And and I really want to hear from the people who were, I was a figment of my parents' imagination too. So please let us know. You can connect with us on X and Instagram at flamealivepod. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook, where you can vote for our next year's historic Olympics. Don't forget about that. And you can get our weekly newsletter filled with other fun stories about this week's episode. You can sign up for that at flamealivepod.com. Next week, Shuk Lestani Blythe Lawrence will be back to talk more about the world of gymnastics. I think we get into artistic gymnastics, too, and do a little preview here. If you missed part one of her conversation, she was on episode 300, so go back and take a listen to it. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. <laughs>